15th of July 1992, London, England. On a summer morning, 23-year-old Rachel Nickell was walking her dog, Molly, across Wimbledon Common with her two-year-old son, Alex. What started off as such a normal day had become an incredible human tragedy. A man appeared from the undergrowth, stabbing Rachel nearly 50 times, then sexually assaulting her. It's an act of the most unspeakable violence. He's doing it to desecrate her body, and he's doing it in front of her son. It takes the breath away. Rachel's young son, Alex, was left alone, clinging to his mother's blood-soaked body. The level of violence used is absolutely horrific, and it's something that really did shock the nation to the core. The depraved killer was 26-year-old Robert Knapper. 16 months later, he would strike again, killing a four-year-old child, Jasmine Bissett, and her 27-year-old mother, Samantha, who was brutally dismembered. Leaving a woman posed in a way that robbed her of dignity, that is beyond simply wanting rid of somebody. That is truly evil. Robert Knapper was a rapist who sadistically attacked mothers in front of their children. He brutally killed two women, then desecrated their bodies, making Robert Knapper one of the world's most evil killers. When Rachel Nickell's murder hit the news, the public were appalled. Her toddler Alex was found alone by a passerby, pleading with his dead mother to get up, mummy. This was the killing of a young woman in front of her infant son, broad daylight, a sunny day in July, on Wimbledon Common, not far from the tennis. I mean, this is desecration of everything that people in Britain hold dear. It literally hypnotised the nation. This was a murder that really did shock because it's that strange of violence that when it happens, it makes us all question our own daily activities. It makes us think about our own level of risk. And while somebody is out there who is preying on strangers, everybody has something to fear. In the desperate hunt to find Rachel's murderer, police became fixated on an innocent man called Colin Stagg. Meanwhile, the real killer, Robert Knapper, slipped under their radar. Just over a year later, he brutally killed and sexually assaulted Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine. Forensic psychologist Lawrence Allison was part of Colin Stagg's defense counsel. A real human tragedy in the sense that whilst all the attention was being allocated to Stag, right on the very doorstep of this was another very similar offence. Horrific mutilation attack on a young woman. The scene was something out of Dante's Inferno. Her body was cut completely open. The, the rib cage had been taken out. The legs had been severed at the knees. The internal organs had been pulled about and repeatedly stabbed. It was beyond belief. Fingerprints left at the scene identified Robert Knapper as the depraved killer. But it wasn't until a cold case review of Rachel Nickell's murder that DNA evidence finally led to Knapper's conviction in 2008 for one of Britain's most notorious crimes. There is something about Knapper that still, to this day, sends a shiver down my spine. In that sense, he is a satanic figure. This killer's story began on the 25th of February, 1966. Robert Clive Knapper was born in Erith, southeast London, and grew up on the nearby Abbey Wood estate. He was the eldest of four, with two brothers and a sister. His parents had a violent relationship his mother was terrified of the father. And this so upset the children that they were all subjected to some counselling 
through, through children psychiatrists. The other children seem to have got over it quite well, but uh, Robert Knapper continued to display behavior which was unusual for a child of his age. At one point, he turned to his father and said, they think I'm mad. His father thought it was a joke, but the awful truth, the reality, is that Napa probably realized, even at a very young age, that he had the capacity for something quite extraordinary. At the age of 12, his parents divorced and his father left the home. Young Napa found it difficult making friends and preferred to spend time on his own. Eventually, he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Asperger's syndrome, you know, is a social disorder, very difficult to make connections with people. He was very isolated at school, very remote figure, and that seems to have carried forward all the way through his life. As Napa entered adolescence, his isolation continued. The young loner was mercilessly bullied at secondary school. He was despised at school, there's no question about that. And people wouldn't play with him, they wouldn't sit with him. He was the archetypal outsider. Napper was teased and bullied a lot in school, which is always devastating for people. These types of things that go on in early childhood are very impactful for how somebody develops later on in life. He spent quite a lot of time in and out of foster care. And what tends to happen when children come from those kind of backgrounds is that they develop this very defensive attitude and outlook. Nobody is going to be there to look out for me, so I have to retaliate first. I have to always be on the attack. Young Napper's anger at the world escalated following a trauma he suffered at the age of 12. He was sexually assaulted by a family friend on a camping holiday. Now, that may have given him a distorted view of sexuality. It may have triggered some kind of reaction in him that identified all sex as somehow abusive. It's possible he had a completely distorted vision of women. As Napper progressed through his teenage years, the angry victim of abuse emerged as the abuser. There were early indications of violence towards his siblings. I believe that he discharged a air gun at the face of one of his siblings. It's pretty clear that he was a bully. He bullied his brothers and he spied on his sister. He was a voyeur. He started peeping at his own sister and then emerged from that. And that aspect of voyeurism, plus a very uncomfortable adolescence, led to Napa becoming, effectively, a time bomb. The troubled Napa left school at 16 and took a job at a local warehouse. Soon he was stalking the streets of southeast London, spying on women he saw at home alone. This was a man who, as he emerged into adulthood, was literally a volcano. One day, his peeping Tom behavior focused on a house next to Wynn's Common and turned into something more sinister. In August 1989, a woman was upstairs drying her hair and her two children were downstairs. A napper broke into the house through the rear door, which they'd left open. He'd walked past two children who were having breakfast at the table, went upstairs, raped his victim, and then said to her, you should keep your door locked, walk back downstairs, past the children, out back over onto the common. He blamed the victim. You never should have left the door open. Do you know how many times I've heard that from offenders over the years? They blame the victim, and it's a way to rationalize, well, they're not fully responsible. You hear time and time again. But Napper couldn't keep his dark secret. A few months later, he confessed to his mother. His mother was so concerned, she reported it to Plumstead Police Station. She was told at the time that a rape hadn't happened on Plumstead Common. The police could find no trace of the rape in their records, so Napper's confession was never followed up. But his mother was so concerned about her son's mental state that she sent him back to a psychiatrist. She certainly was worried enough to refer him again to the Maudsley Hospital for further treatment, which he did go back to. 
but discharged himself after a short period of analysis and counselling. As Napa's mental health deteriorated, his mother cut off contact. He continued his stalking behaviour and marked his hunting grounds on an A to Z. His favourite was the green chain network of footpaths that winds its way through parkland across southeast London. This is a sexual predator on the loose. In the first months of 1992, he commits a series of attacks, attacking women chillingly, almost caressing his victims with a knife blade. He's a man out of control and absolutely consumed by sexual lust. Not for a relationship, but simply for the power. By March, he'd made two attempted rapes. He really didn't penetrate the victim sexually because he was impotent at the crime scene in almost all of the cases. What does that mean? The violence takes the place of it. He was becoming, I think, increasingly frustrated, at feelings of rage, and that violence was bubbling beneath the surface. His attacks became progressively more violent. He changed his targets, aiming for a different type of victim. His fantasies rotated around young mothers with young children. And in May 1992, he ties a ligature around a 22-year-old as she pushes her baby daughter in a buggy. He pulls her into the undergrowth, strips her, rapes her, beats her, she begs for her life, and he runs off. He viciously assaulted her. When she arrived at a relative's house, she wasn't recognised initially. She was so badly injured. The child was absolutely terrorised, and that was just another level of sadistic gratification for Napper. But soon, sexual assaults and beatings wouldn't be enough to satisfy the depraved urges of the mentally unstable Robert Knapper. Soon, he'd feel the need to carry out the ultimate of his sadistic fantasies, murder. By now, police had linked these sexual attacks and in June established Operation Eccleston to investigate the so-called green chain rapist. But Robert Napper remained at large, and on the morning of the 15th of July, 1992, he set his sights on another young mother walking with her child on Wimbledon Common. 23-year-old ex-model Rachel Nickell. The events that followed would make an indelible mark on the nation. So this was any normal day in July. It was a nice sunny day. Rachel's walking with her son and their dog across the common for what should have been the most normal walk in the world. This is a place where she went often. It was somewhere she felt safe, she felt secure. And it's quite likely that Napa had been stalking Rachel for, for some time. Napa was lurking in the undergrowth nearby. He was clearly looking for a victim. But this time, it wasn't so much the sexual urge, it was the fantasy of killing a woman that had come into its fullest Napa waited until Rachel and her young son Alex came close and then attacked. He prodded her in the back with a knife to move her to a sort of cop's slightly more secluded area, forced her to kneel down and attacked her. He slit her throat and then stabbed her nearly 50 times in front of her son. A you know, really horrific, disturbing offence. She was stabbed in the abdomen many times after she had obviously been killed. She was sexually assaulted and then left in the company of her child whilst he made good his escape. A witness saw Napper washing Rachel's blood off his hands in a nearby stream. It was an act of such callousness and such bravura. He didn't run. He walked calmly away from this obscenity that he committed without Apparently a moment's hesitation or looking back, he just calmly walked away. Two-year-old Alex was left alone holding his mother's dead body until an elderly walker found him amidst the horrific scene. Absolutely heartbreaking stuff. He's thinking that she's asleep or she's unconscious and she's basically lying there and he's saying, wake up, mummy. You know, this is, this is really horrific. He wouldn't really know how to make sense of this. 
Soon the news spread of Rachel's death. Stories about the abhorrent crime continually hit the headlines in the weeks that followed. It absolutely captured the public imagination. Unprovoked attack on a young woman and her child in broad daylight on Wimbledon Common. And the stories of the boy saying, wake up, mummy, get up, mummy. I mean, touch the heartstrings of the nation. It occupied everyone's mind. I think there was a huge amount of pressure on the police to solve the crime. And the difficulty was that the killer had actually left no forensic clue that was capable of being detected at the scene at all. And the police really had absolutely nothing to go on. Pressure to solve the case was mounting in an effort to determine the type of individual most likely to be Rachel's killer, the Metropolitan Police brought in a psychological profiler. Between the police and the profiler, they constructed a profile of the offender, a guy in his late 20s, early 30s, an individual that didn't have very successful relationships with women, that may well live on his own, and was interested in strange things such as Satanism and so on. An EFIT photograph was constructed based on the suspect seen washing his hands, and this was sent out across the national media. 30-year-old local man Colin Stagg was named in several phone calls to the police. Colin lived within about two miles of the offence. He was also picked out in an identity parade and subsequently was interviewed by the police. Police visited his flat. They felt that the flat was odd, partly because Colin Stagg had one of the rooms painted black and on that, some of the walls, there were some seemingly strange chalk drawings, which we now know were part of the Wiccan religion, but were interpreted in more sinister ways by the police at the time. They had no real evidence apart from identification evidence of one witness who put him on the common at the time. So they made a decision to try and draw that evidence from him by introducing an undercover police officer to get him to confess to the murder. It was all sanctioned at the very highest level at New Scotland Yard. Under Operation Edzel, a young blonde female detective was sent undercover using the pseudonym of Lizzie James. In a so-called honey trap operation, she approached Colin Stagg through a dating section in the local newspaper. Very risky, very unusual operation. And the idea essentially was to befriend Stagg uh, through a series of letters, through a Lonely Hearts column. And the intention of the undercover operation was to establish whether Stagg would know something about the offence that only the offender would know. And secondly, would he, in his dealings with Lizzie James, show any of the sexual fantasies or behaviours that the profiler had predicted that this sort of offender would be interested in? The police now seem fixated on proving Colin Stagg's guilt using the relatively new trend in criminal investigation, psychological profiling. In any case where profiling becomes prominent in investigation, you're headed for disaster. Profiling behavior can be useful, but only as an add-on. It's just a way to give the police another way to look at things. Profiling should never, ever take the place of time-tested investigative techniques. Meanwhile, Rachel's real killer, Robert Knapper, was still on the loose. So obviously part of the problem with the fixation on Colin Stagg at the time was that Knapper must have been thinking, wow, this is fantastic, the, you know, all the heat's off me, no one's looking at me. So I suspect that this emboldened Knapper to go on. At the end of August 1992, Knapper did, however, come onto the police radar, but this was under Operation Eccleston the team investigating his earlier rapes along the Green Chain Walk. After publicising an e-fit of the suspected rapist, Napper's name had been put forward by two of his neighbours. Napper is invited to the police station and asked to give a blood sample. He doesn't turn up. He's invited again. He doesn't turn up again. There are countless occasions in which Napper is identified as a possible suspect he slips through the net. Eventually, in late October, the police wrongly concluded that Napper wasn't their man. 
the description given by all of the victims, except one, was that the attacker was approximately five foot 10 inches tall. So a policy decision was made that anyone below five foot six and over six foot would be eliminated from the inquiry. He was described as being over six foot one. So on that and that alone, he was eliminated from the inquiry. Now Robert Knapper had escaped the police's watchful eye, he was free to roam the streets unhindered once again. Using his trusty A to Z map, he continued to stalk southeast London, marking places he'd spotted more potential victims. So it's very common to engage in what we call behavioural tryouts. So if they're going to attack a particular victim, they won't suddenly go out one day and make that attack. They will stalk, track, uh, observe. And when all the indications are with Napa that he was doing that. He would go for walks, he would select victims, heaping Tom behaviour, looking through windows, selecting victims, targeting specific houses, was all very significant in Napa's criminal repertoire. In July 1993, Napa's name came onto the police radar once again when he was reported prowling and spying on a house near Plumstead Common. The police officer who investigated reported him as a potential rapist. Once again, no further action was taken. Now Napa was stalking homes around one of his favourite haunts, Wynn's Common. He was looking for his next victim. Napa is hiding in the bushes again and sees a 27-year-old woman called Samantha Bissett, who has a daughter, Jasmine. Well, one version of it is that he sees Samantha making love with her boyfriend through the window and is so aroused by this one night, Samantha Bissett said to her then partner, I've seen someone at our window looking in at the window. We now know that that was Robert Knapper. So again, the modus operandi was exactly the same, picking on a victim, stalking the victim, ruminating through what he was going to do to that victim. On the evening of the 3rd of November, Knapper saw that Samantha was alone in her flat. Her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine, was asleep in her bedroom. Knapper climbed onto the balcony and broke in through the window. He startled Samantha in her hallway. He attacks Samantha with a knife. He stabs her eight times. One blow so severe that it snaps her spinal cord. It is yet further example of Napa's grotesque depravity. But it doesn't even end there. The killer turned his mind to Samantha's sleeping daughter. He proceeds to sexually assault the four-year-old daughter, Jasmine, and suffocates her in her bedroom with her duvet and leaves her body on the bed surrounded by her toys. If we look at the method that Napa used to kill Jasmine, after he'd sexually assaulted her, he suffocated her. So he's using a different method to the method he used on her mother. And I think this is potentially a case of him mixing up his offending, because offenders get bored. They like to vary it. They like to keep things interesting. But Napa's grotesque fantasies were not complete. He then dragged mother Samantha's body into the lounge. Napa eviscerates Samantha's body. He cuts her from the chest to the crotch, peels back her skin, cracks the ribs, literally eviscerates this innocent young woman's body in a horrifying, horrible attack. After pulling away her ribs, Napa repeatedly stabbed Samantha's internal organs. He mutilates her body. He actually takes a part of the skin from her abdominal wall, presumably as some sort of trophy. There are deep cuts in her legs, almost as if attempting to dismember her. This is an escalation of his behavior. Once he has finished with the mutilation, he poses Samantha in a very sexually provocative pose. He positioned her body on a cushion, and her body was left in the, the same position 
as it was when she had sex with her boyfriend. Now, that basically is, is saying that this woman is sexually available. He is trying to create a narrative here. He's trying to say that she deserved this. And that really does tell us about his misogyny. Posing a victim following a murder of a sexual nature is very, very common. They pose the victim because killing alone is not psychosexually sufficient. And so they go beyond killing to satisfy themselves. It's sexually stimulating. It's a fusion of sex and aggression so that the aggressive act itself is eroticized. Robert Knapper had now gained the status of a serial killer treasuring the part of Samantha's abdomen that he'd removed for safekeeping, the triple murderer left the horrific scene. Samantha's boyfriend made the tragic discovery the next morning. He entered the flat and found Samantha's body in the living room. At first, he thought it was some sort of macabre joke because the body was destroyed, and he thought it was some form of mannequin, and he ran back to the kitchen and called the police. Former Detective Sergeant Alan Jackerman was one of the first to arrive at Samantha's flat. In all my years of service, I've never seen anything so dreadful and so horrific. From the state that the body was in, the, the way that she'd been attacked and dismembered, this was a crime way, way beyond normality, way out of the ordinary. One member of the forensic team investigating at the scene was so traumatized they had to take two years sick leave. The way Samantha's daughter Jasmine had been left by the killer was also deeply troubling for investigators. Jasmine had been attacked in her cot. Her quilt had been put back over and she had the appearance of being a child asleep, which was somehow more disturbing and seen what was left of her mother. Napa had seemingly left little in the way of evidence except a partial footprint in blood. Every single fingerprint that the police found in Samantha's flat was eliminated, including those belonging to little Jasmine's friends who'd recently visited for her fourth birthday party. There wasn't a good suspect coming into the frame. Um, we went six months down the line, and we all knew that this wasn't a one-off killing, so we concentrated our minds to try and find out who was responsible for this. In addition to that, of course, it had no oxygen of publicity from the media because it was a single mother whom the press erroneously believed was on the ages of prostitution, so it didn't get much past the second page of the new shopper. When we're comparing the media coverage, Rachel Nickell's murder received an awful lot more attention than Samantha and Jasmine Bissett. And you're know, making judgments about this victim as to how worthy they are of attention. And what we've got here is, is judgments being made about appropriate femininity and appropriate motherhood. So Rachel was in a, a secure long-term relationship with her partner, Samantha's daughter, her father didn't live with the family. So I think all of those kind of new right, neoliberal values about what a, a family should look like are coming out here in the media's choice to emphasize the Nikel case over the Bissett case. With few leads to go on, the team investigating Samantha and Jasmine's murders was wound down to just five officers. Desperate for a breakthrough, in May 1994, the senior investigating officer took a punt and asked for the fingerprints found at the scene to be re-examined. He insisted that it was done, and then, within a few days, sheepishly, the fingerprint officer returned to say that they had made a mistake. That transpired that three fingerprint sets within the flat did not come from the victim. They came from some unknown person. When they were sent back for analysis, they came back as Robert Knapper, a man who had not featured in our inquiry at all. At last, the police had Robert Knapper in their sights. When they delved into his history, they discovered he had a criminal record. We found that he had this firearm offence, and in the property store, 
was still some of the property appertaining to that offence. One of the items was an A to Z book, which, when we looked at it, had lots of routes, plans, which coincided with our murder and, more specifically, with the green chain rape offences. Also clearly marked out was the Isabella Plantation, very close to Wimbledon Common, and that immediately rang bells with Rachel McKell. When Detective Sergeant Jackerman found Napper's mugshot on police file, they made another startling discovery. One of the indexes took one look at the photograph. She had worked on the Green Chain Rape Inquiry, and she said, that is the Green Chain Rapist. So I ran out to the front office and took down from the wall the poster asking for information on the Green Chain Rapist, which had a photo fit on it, and we compared the photographs, and they were very, very similar. Having possibly connected Napa to further crimes as well as the Bissett murders, Detective Jackerman and his colleagues put the suspected killer under surveillance. The surveillance team had followed him and he was carrying out some really strange behaviour, going on long walks on his own, looking at camping equipment, firearm magazines, buying uh, pornographic magazines. So. It was felt, as it was a bank holiday weekend, we couldn't take the risk that he might go out and kill somebody. The net was now closing in on triple murderer Robert Knapper. On the 21st of May, detectives went to his Plumstead flat to make an arrest. He went to work, like clockwork, every morning at 7 a.m. We stood outside well before 7 a.m. He didn't appear. So we're starting to get worried then that perhaps he wasn't in there. It turned out that Napper had been fired from his job the previous day and was still in bed. He was startled when the police knocked at his door. He was totally shocked. He was immediately handcuffed, told why he was under arrest, and a search was subsequently made and another A to Z found knives and lots of incriminating evidence. Police had now found a second A to Z belonging to Napa that showed markings next to Samantha Bissett's home. In his flat, detectives also discovered a receipt for a pair of size nine Adidas trainers. A blooded footprint from exactly the same shoe had been found at the murder scene. We were able to take his DNA. The DNA, no surprise to us, matched that of the green chain rapist. So he was then in in the frame for two rapes and two attempted rapes, plus our two murders. In July, Napa was charged and held on remand in prison, but there still wasn't a link with the first murder of 23-year-old Rachel Nickell on Wimbledon Common two years earlier. However, Detective Jackerman was convinced he was Rachel's killer. We went to the Wimbledon inquiry and put Napper up as uh, a suspect for the Rachel Nickell murder, by which time they had in their frame their suspect, Colin Stagg. Despite our bringing this new suspect into the frame, he was never, ever considered. This innocent man, Colin Stagg, was being held in custody for Rachel's killing. Barrister William Clegg was working on his defence for the forthcoming trial. I always thought he was a very unlikely killer because of his personality, but it wasn't until I really read the papers that it became obvious to me that there was not a shred of evidence against him. The police, however, believe their honey trap operation proved Colin Stagg was Rachel's killer, based on exchanges he'd had with their undercover female operative, Lizzie James. Criminal psychologist Lawrence Allison examined this evidence for Colin Stagg's defence team and was concerned by what he found. He said that in one of the meetings that he had with Lizzie James, he almost dropped his chips in talking to her because what she was asking him for was so bizarre and off the wall. And of course, Stagg starts writing fantasies that go down that line, not because he has them, but because he wants to please a person that's offering him sex. 
This was turned gradually into the attack on Wimbledon Common, and he was encouraged to admit to having committed the murder, but he never, ever did. When it finally came to a pre-committal hearing on the 14th of September, the judge threw out the case against Colin Stagg. Colin tragically spent 13 months in custody awaiting trial, but it never went to full trial, and Lord Chief Justice Ognall described it as deceptive conduct of the grossest kind. The undercover operation, quite rightly, was thrown out. The judge recognised that there was never any evidence against me, no forensic evidence, no confession evidence, nothing at all. Colin Stagg was eventually awarded over £700,000 in damages by the Metropolitan Police and given a formal apology. Five days after his acquittal, a review of the Rachel Nickel murder investigation was launched. Gradually, at that point, the recognition is that perhaps there is a link between Rachel Nickel's killing and Samantha Bissett's killing. Gradually, the two forces coalesce so that it becomes clear that Napa could well have been responsible for both killings. Napa was interviewed by the review team about Rachel's killing, but as the police still had no evidence linking him to the scene, this led to a dead end. Nearly a year later, though, in October 1995, Robert Napa's trial date was set for the murders of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett and for one count of rape and two counts of attempted rape for his green chain walk attacks. Barrister William Clegg was defending him. I've met Robert Napper at Broadmoor Mental Hospital where he was on remand awaiting his trial. It was soon fairly obvious to me that he was um, suffering from serious delusions. He firmly believed members of the royal family were visiting him in Broadmoor. He was an extremely ill man. Despite being diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, an assessment by four different psychiatrists concluded Napa was fit to stand. The trial for the murders of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett began at the Old Bailey on the 9th of October. We were on the edges of our seats as we sat outside number one court waiting for the trial to begin, when all of a sudden the commotion and everybody started running out of the court and the word goes around that he's pleaded to manslaughter through diminished responsibility. There's a mixed feeling because manslaughter is not a conviction of murder. However, under the circumstances, it was obvious that he was mentally very, very ill and it was an omission of sorts and a conviction. I think what can tend to happen is that the assumption can be made that the offender isn't responsible for what they've done, but he actually was in this case. He knew exactly what he was doing, he knew what he was doing was wrong, and he chose to do it anyway. Napper was sentenced to life in Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital in Berkshire. I think the sentence was inevitable. The best place for him was a special hospital, and it was important for everybody that he remain there. But DS Jackerman wasn't finished with Robert Napper. He was still convinced Napper was also responsible for the killing of Rachel Nickel on Wimbledon Common in July 1992. That became all consuming. We became more and more convinced over the years that he was responsible for the Rachel Nickel killing. DS Jackerman had relayed his suspicions about Napa to Rachel Nickel's original murder inquiry team, but they already had a suspect awaiting trial, and the evidence he presented wasn't given the recognition it deserved. Now, under a new review team, DS Jackerman made it his business to tell the senior investigating officer about Robert Napa. I went into my office, wrote out a report giving all the details as to why I believed that Robert Napper was guilty of killing Rachel McKell, gave it back to him, and he took it and put him on the list. A new forensics team was appointed, and in July 2004, advances in DNA techniques led to a breakthrough. Samples taken from Rachel's body revealed a mixed DNA profile of her killer. Soon, this was identified as belonging to serial murderer Robert Napper. 
other evidence was also re-examined, linking him to the scene. In Rachel's child's hair were found some flakes of red paint. Nobody quite knows how this happened, but they were found to match a toolbox recovered from Robert Knapper's flat on his arrest. An old pair of shoes that Knapper still had with him in Broadmoor were also seized. They were examined against shoe prints found against the man seen washing his hands near the scene of Rachel Kell's murder, and those shoes matched the shoe prints next to the screen. Gradually, the case is built against Napa, but it's not until 2006 that he's interviewed again about the possibility of his killing Rachel Mikkel. It took another two years until the 18th of December 2008 for Rachel's family to finally see justice, 16 years after her death. 42-year-old Robert Napa returned to the Old Bailey charged with her murder. He sat there and he didn't look much different. And it was in a dream that the charges were read and he pleaded guilty to Rachel's manslaughter. Once again, Napa pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. The judge sentenced him to remain in Broadmoor Hospital indefinitely. For Detective Sergeant Jackerman, it was the moment he'd waited years to witness. Just before he went down the steps, he turned, looked directly at me and recognised me, and I just mouthed, hello, Bob. It was a satisfying moment, but it was more than that. It was, it was relief, it was vindication, really, of, of all those years of plugging away. It brought to a close one of the most upsetting murder cases in British criminal history. Napper is completely devoid of any conscience. He doesn't care about the impact of his actions on others, and that makes him a very dangerous man indeed. His mental state, whether he's schizophrenic, really have nothing to do with the crimes. The important point is that he's off the street and can't hurt anybody again. The man knows no humanity. The man has utter disregard for a human life. He took inordinate pleasure from the suffering of his victims. Napa raped and sexually assaulted women as they walked across London's parklands and commons. He homed in on vulnerable mothers and took sadistic pleasure from attacking them in front of their children. He brutally slayed two women in the prime of their life, then sexually assaulted and killed a four-year-old child. That makes Robert Napa one of the world's most evil killers.